Namaste. So in this video, we're going to try to finish up the discussion on the real nature of the self and explain, for example, why doesn't the self see anything in deep sleep? Verse 23. That it does not see in that state is because, although seeing then, it does not see. For the vision of the witness can never be lost because it is immortal. But there is not that second thing separate from it which it can see. 24. That it does not smell in that state is because, although smelling then, it does not smell. For the smeller's function of smelling can never be lost, because it is immortal. But there is not that second thing separate from it which it can smell. That it does not taste in that state is because, although tasting then, it does not taste. For the taster's function of tasting can never be lost, because it is immortal. But there is not that second thing separate from it which it can taste. That it does not speak in that state is because, although speaking then, it does not speak. For the speaker's function of speaking can never be lost, because it is immortal. But there is not that second thing separate from it which it can speak. That it does not hear in that state is because, although hearing then, it does not hear. For the listener's function of hearing can never be lost, because it is immortal. But there is not that second thing separate from it which it can hear. That it does not think in that state is because, although thinking then, it does not think. For the thinker's function of thinking can never be lost, because it is immortal. But there is not that second thing separate from it which it can think. That it does not touch in that state is because, although touching then, it does not touch. For the toucher's function of touching can never be lost, because it is immortal. But there is not that second thing separate from it which it can touch. That it does not know in that state is because, although knowing then, it does not know. For the knower's function of knowing can never be lost, because it is immortal. But there is not that second thing separate from it which it can know. So these verses are extremely profound. That is, in the state of Sushupti, in deep sleep, and also in Turiya, even though all the functions of the self are present, they don't operate or they don't seem to because there's no objects. There's no second thing, no other thing to smell, taste, touch, see, know, think, whatever. So, of course, this is like a paraphrase or a, a long explanation of that famous verse from the second chapter, also spoken by Yajnavalkya, which is also repeated in the seventh chapter. I mean, this is just a very, very important verse. Because when there is duality, as it were, then one smells something, one sees something, one hears something, one speaks something, one thinks something, one knows something. But when to the knower of Brahman everything has become the self, then what should one smell and through what? What should one see and through what? What should one hear and through what? What should one speak and through what? What should one think and through what? What should one know and through what? Through what should one know that owing to which all this is known? Through what, O oh Maitreyi, should one know the knower? So thinking, knowing, speaking, seeing, and all the rest are simply functions of duality in which the various sense objects are present. 
But when one has transcended duality, as in the case during Sushupti, or in the case of being in self-realization and being a knower of Brahman, then these sense objects do not appear. And so the self, even though he is perfectly capable of seeing, hearing, and tasting, and so on, doesn't because there are no objects. So some people might say, well, isn't this horrible? He doesn't know anything, he doesn't see anything, etc. Well, is deep sleep horrible? No, it's joyful, it's blissful, it's the Ananda Maya Kosha. But in full self-realization, one leaves even the Ananda Maya Kosha behind. Because Ananda Maya Kosha is full of bliss, but it itself is not bliss. Bliss is Brahma, the self. So when one attains the self, or when rather one realizes that one is the self, has always been the self, will always be the self, then the need even for the Ananda Maya Kosha vanishes. And there's nothing to see, feel, sense, touch, think, know, etc. This is not a bad thing. <laughs> this is a wonderful thing. See, because people are attached to the objects of the senses, because they care about the world, which is a theme that we introduced way back in the very first video series on this channel, back in 2012. Because of that, one thinks of death as a loss, and so struggles against it or perceives it as painful and bad, a negative thing, and so forth. But if one is in a state of self-realization, one has no care for the world because one is complete in oneself. Now, rather than try to explain what the Upanishads have already explained <laughs> in such wonderful clarity, I want to read a passage from the Chandogu Upanishad and some excerpts from Shankaracharya's Tika, or his uh, Bhashya, actually. Uh, it's a full-blown commentary on the Chandogya. When one attains bliss, then he acts. Without attaining bliss, he does not act. Only on attaining bliss does one act. But bliss itself should be sought to be understood. Revered Sir, I wish to understand bliss. Now, this is a conversation between uh, Narada Muni and Sanat Kumara, one of Lord Brahma's mental sons. And Narada is approaching, he, he is also a mental son of Brahma. But the difference is that Sanat Kumara is fully self-realized and Narada is only partially self-realized. So although he tastes bliss, Ananda Mayakosha, he has not become bliss itself. Therefore, he seeks to understand bliss. And the rest of this section is about that. That which is infinite is bliss. There is no bliss in what is finite. The infinite alone is bliss. But the infinite itself should be sought to be understood. Revered Sir, I wish to understand the infinite. Basya, that which is infinite, large, unexcelled, highest, much, all these are synonyms. And this is bliss. What is less than the infinite is excelled by this letter. Probably means latter. Hence it is called finite, small. Hence, in what is finite there is no bliss, because the finite or the small 
always gives rise to longing for what is more than that, and all longing is a source of pain. And in the world it has been found that what is a source of pain, such as fever and other diseases, is not bliss. Hence, it is quite correct to say that there is no bliss in what is finite. Hence, the infinite alone is bliss, especially because in the infinite there is no possibility of any sources of pain, like longing and the rest. Wherein one sees nothing else, hears nothing else, and understands nothing else, that is the infinite. Wherein one sees something else, hears something else, and understands something else, that is finite. That which is infinite is immortal. That which is finite is mortal. Revered sir, wherein does that rest? In its own majesty, or not in majesty? Basya. He explains what the distinguishing character of the infinite is. Wherein, in which infinite, as an entity, does the seer not see anything else, which is to be seen by means of other sense organs, as distinct from the seer himself? Similarly, one hears nothing else, inasmuch as name and form alone are meant to be included here, the text mentions only the apprehensions of those alone in the shape of seeing and hearing, and the others being mentioned as merely illustratives. But reflection should be understood to be included here by some such expression as when one reflects upon nothing else, as understanding is almost invariably preceded by reflection. Similarly, when one understands nothing else, that which has this character is the infinite. So the infinite, the self, is that in which there is nothing else to be seen, heard, felt, reflected upon, understood, or whatever. There is only the self. And the self is oneself. <laughs> So, see, people have a hard time understanding Brahman because they are so conditioned by duality, they can't even imagine that there could be a state in which seeing, hearing, etc., nothing is blissful. They're chasing bliss in the finite, that which is limited, that which is other than the self. But there is no bliss in the non-self can't be, because the non-self is always going to be different. It's never going to be what we want, because it's not the self. But in the self alone, all desires are satisfied, because the self, what the self really wants is the self, itself. <laughs> I know this sounds very tautological and... It's difficult to understand at first, but if you keep contemplating it, the self will become inclined to reveal itself. And this is the actual method of self-realization. Anyway, let me go on. Sanat Kumara answered, in its own majesty, that is, the infinite rests in its own majesty, greatness, and splendor. This is the answer for you if you wish to know the resting place of the infinite, in some cases, to satisfy your intellectual curiosity. If, however, you wish to know the real truth, then the answer is that the infinite does not rest even upon majesty. It is without a resting place, without a substratum, anywhere at all. In the world... What they call majesty is cows and horses, elephants and gold, slaves and wives, lands and houses. I do not say this, he said, as in that case one thing would rest upon another. What I do say is this that follows. That itself is below, 
that above, that behind, that before, that to the right, that to the left. That itself is all this. Next follows the teaching through the notion of I. I itself is below, I above, I behind, I before, I to the right, I to the left. The I is all this. Basya. It is explained why the infinite is not based upon anything. Because it is the infinite itself which is below, and there is nothing else apart from it which is below it, upon which it would rest. Similarly, it is above, etc., etc., as above. If there existed something apart from the infinite, then alone could the infinite rest upon something else. As a matter of fact, however, there is nothing apart from the infinite. The infinite itself is all. Hence, it follows that the infinite does not rest upon anything. In view of the assertion, wherein one sees nothing else, which implies the idea of container and contained, and the present assertion, that is below, which appears to refer to something not before the eyes of the speaker and is something different, it would give rise to the idea in someone's mind that the infinite is something different from the perceiving living self. In order to preclude the possibility of such an idea arising, there follows the teaching through the notion of I, which shows that the infinite is non-different from the perceiver, and it is the infinite itself which is spoken of I being below, etc., etc. Now follows the teaching through the self. The self itself is below, the self above, the self behind, the self before, the self to the right, the self to the left, the self is all this. One who sees thus, reflects thus, and understands thus, loves the self, revels with the self, enjoys the company of the self, and rejoices in the self. He becomes the self-sovereign, or king of heaven. He becomes free to do what he pleases in all regions, while those that know otherwise than this are ruled by others, and live in perishable regions, and they are not free to do what they please in all regions. So this is the meaning of liberation and bondage. When the self is situated in itself, when the infinite, in other words, is only resting upon the infinite, then all there is is the infinite, and there is nothing else to be perceived. Oh, but the infinite, the self, can perceive itself through objectless, unconditioned awareness. This is Turiya consciousness. So through this Turiya, or in the absence of any external objects at all, turiya tita, the self revels in itself. It itself is its companion. It is its own enjoyment. It is not dependent on anything whatsoever. So this is the real meaning of self. This is the real meaning of Brahman. This is the real meaning of self-realization. And this is the state which is first glimpsed in deep sleep. Everybody loves a good night's sleep, isn't it? So everybody loves the self. The self loves the self. I love myself. You love yourself. You love to be in that state where only the self exists. In fact, it is a necessity of life, as I've pointed out several times, that if a person is deprived of deep sleep, they go crazy within just a few days. So the self and being in this state where there is only the self and no other thing to perceive is absolutely necessary because 
it recharges our batteries, as it were. Huh? As it were. <laughs> when some sees something else, as it were, huh? then there is something to experience. But when one realizes that all is Brahman, then what is there to see? Brahman. And through what? Brahman. And what is there to know? Brahman. And through what? Brahman. <laughs> Therefore, O oh Maitreyi, through what should one know that through which all else is known? It can't be known. That's why there are no perceptions in Sushupti and Turiya, Turiya Tita. In ordinary Turiya, the other states of consciousness are perceived. So Turiya is the substrate of all other states of consciousness. But in the absence of those states of consciousness, Turiya becomes Turiya Tita. And this is the ultimate state. After the finishing of the body, when the body drops off, when the prarabdha karma is used up, and there is no more cause for any more actions, there is no more objects for any perceptions, at that point, then complete liberation is attained and one realizes the self as Brahman, not as something less than Brahman, because if there's something less than Brahman, then one is always craving the full self. See, this is why we need deep sleep, because in waking consciousness and even in dream consciousness, we are less than the full self. We are covered by upadis, intelligence, ego, mind, senses, body, so forth. So in those states, there is always craving for the infinite. And therefore, there is pain. Whenever there is craving, whenever there is desire, there is suffering. And desire is always going to be there in any state in which we are anything less than the self or Brahman. But of course, you know, the joke is that we are already Brahman. We have always been Brahman and we can't really be anything but Brahman yet. By entertaining these upadis, we seem to become less than Brahman, as it were, huh? due to maya, which is beginningless, inexplicable, deep and, and fundamental, because this is the complete or ultimate duality. The difference between Nirguna Brahman and Saguna Brahman, between Shiva and Shakti, between the self and the not self, between the subject and the object, see, which makes consciousness possible. But consciousness, because it is dual, is always attended by suffering because the self always wants to be infinite. And if it's not, then it strives to become so. And in the lower stages of consciousness, one tries to become whole by adding other things unto what is misperceived as the self, the, mainly the body. So one tries to acquire all kinds of objects and wealth and, you know, relatives and a wife and this and that and the other thing. Huh? But this only causes more and more suffering <laughs> because at the root of it all, one still conceives of oneself as less than infinite. Otherwise, why are all these possessions necessary? Actually, they're not. That is why when one realizes the self, when one realizes aham pramasmi, 
I am Brahman, then he becomes a Jivan Mukta, an Avaduta, who is completely independent, self-supported, does not need anything else to be completely happy. Huh? Not that he is blissful, but he is bliss itself. In that state, there are no desires because one is fully the infinite. <laughs> Talk about bliss. This is bliss never ending. So one should understand that actual self-realization is really indescribable. It's like words fail to approach the mind, the intelligence fail to approach the self. Even consciousness cannot approach the self. The self is beyond all these. This is inconceivable, I know. But these words of the Upanishads are like fingers pointing at the moon. Hey, it's over there, you know. There's a wonderful passage in one of the Upanishads, I forget which, in which someone is trying to point out the North Star. And he begins by pointing out a tree. See that tree over there? And see that branch that comes up off that tree? And you see the tip of that branch? Now, if you follow that branch the way it's pointing just a little bit more, you'll see this little star. And that's the North Star. See? So this is why the scriptures exist. This is why the teachings exist. This is why they're the Jivan Muktas, out of compassion, try to teach others, even though actually from their perspective, there is no teaching and no need of any teaching because everything is already Brahman. Still, <laughs> when we are as Jivan Muktas, we can remember back when, before we realized Brahman, and there was all this suffering and all this desire and all this ignorance and all this incompletion, all this finite nature. And because of that, there was uh, always this urge to try to become the self, to try to become infinite. And this is the driving force behind all human life, whether it's in... Uh, Ordinary learning or scriptural learning, performance of, of uh, religious rituals to gain good karma, or in development of bhakti, which is love of God, a God symbol, a metaphor of Brahman, or whether there is a quest for emptiness in meditation, neti neti, huh? or whether there is finally realization of bliss in the form of uh, Turiya, that this is the fundamental consciousness upon which all others rest. But it itself does not rest on anything. And therefore, when one attains this, or I should say recognizes it, because we are already Brahman, then one becomes the king of heaven and has the freedom of all the worlds. Aung Tatsat. Aung Shakti Aung. Aung Namah Shivaya. <laughs>